Thank you. I'd like to join all the previous speakers and I'm sure also all the future speakers who will thank the organizers for putting together such a wonderful meeting and with this spectacular hospitality. I also want to thank them for inviting me to speak here. And some of the people in the audience have already heard various versions of this talk that I either gave longer versions or I put part of it in the context of other talks. So first I apologize to them. You're given full permission to leave now if you want. And, but I also changed some things a little bit so that there will be things that are not completely new but at least were not presented in this form before. So this is based on a lot of work that was done with some with my collaborators, some this thing was done uh, by other people. And it culminated in this paper that was written uh, last December with David Gaiotto, Anton Kapustin, and Brian Willett. And the goal of the talk, I'll summarize it first in one slide. So we'll be discussing global symmetries as opposed to gauge symmetries. And ordinary global symmetries are very useful. They help us organize our information. They can be used to classify local operators. This is true whether the symmetry is spontaneously broken or not. And the chart states for ordinary symmetries. This is something that is meaningful only if the symmetry is not spontaneously broken. The charge states are particles. The particles assign charge. And this is meaningful, again, only if the symmetry is not spontaneously broken. So the generalization of that will be to extended objects. Here the charged operators, instead of being point-like, they will be associated with lines or surfaces, etc. I'll use the words operators or defects or observables interchangeably because I've, I'll have a more Euclidean version of the thing. So if you, wrote, you put it in along the time direction, it's a defect. If you put it along the space direction, it's an operator. And again, if the symmetry is not spontaneously broken, something that I will define later, they are charged objects, and the charged objects will be strings, domain walls, etc. Now, this picture is intuitively clear, and a lot of us feel that we already know that. People talked about charges per unit volume. This exists in BPS formulas and so forth. I'll, the new thing here is that I'll give a more systematic and complete picture of these global symmetries. And this more systematic way will give new derivations of known results and will also lead to a long list of new results that were not known uh, before. And what we will do is just take our favorite textbook about quantum field theory, and whatever is done for ordinary symmetries, we'll have the opportunity to do it again now for these generalized symmetries. So we just turn the page and we can do it again. So that was very efficient and very useful. Now, the gauge version of these symmetries is well, well studied. Historically, it was first appeared, in the, as far as I could tell, in the paper of Kalb and Ramon. They studied the two-form gauge field that couples to strings, generalizing the way an ordinary gauge field couples to particles, say in electrodynamics. It, that's the first time it appears in the physics literature. The second time is in what is known in lattice gauge theory as the Villain formulation, where you put the gauge fields on plaquettes or cubes, and interactions are product around the object. It's also in string theory and in supergravity. These higher form gauge fields are ubiquitous. There they are a lot of them. And in mathematics, that appears in what is known as Chigger Simons theory. I would like to emphasize and to stress that we should really be thinking about the global symmetries before we discuss the gauge symmetries. And there are really two reasons for that. First, when we learn in quantum field theory about ordinary symmetries, we first discuss the global symmetry and only later do we gauge them because the global symmetries are more elementary than the local symmetries. Second, as I'll show later and I'll give more examples, these global symmetries can have anomalies. And if they have anomalies, they cannot be gauged. Perhaps they can be coupled to flat gauge fields but not to full flat gauge fields. In that sense, we should really be studying the global symmetries be, rather than just discuss the gauge symmetries. So having that, said that, I'd like to give first a presentation of ordinary symmetries, a presentation that might look a little bit strange, but it's the one that makes it easy to generalize. So what is an ordinary global symmetry? An ordinary global symmetry is characterized, from this point of view, by the existence of an operator U associated with a codimension 1 manifold M, 
And the group element, little g, well, little g is an element of the global symmetry group g. One intuitive way of thinking about it is think of space-time, say four dimensions, and this m being all of space. So this is the operator that implements the transformation, the global symmetry transformation on all of space. That's what symmetries often do. We can also let it be in Euclidean space, some closed co-dimension one manifold, so that as we cross it, we undergo the global symmetry transformation. This definition is good whether the symmetry is continuous or discrete, because I don't need the local structure, which exists only if the symmetry is uh, continuous. And it's also valid whether the symmetry is spontaneously broken or not, because this is something the text addresses what happens at short distance in the theory. We don't need to discuss all of space-time. We don't care what happens in the infrared. And once we have such an object, U, we can study its correlation functions. And the correlation functions are topological. This is the statement that this is a symmetry. So we can take the manifold M and deform it a little bit. We will get exactly the same answer. The answer will not change under such small deformations. And we can multiply such operators. Take one of them, it's manifold M, and multiply another one. And that would give us the operator U associated with the product of the group elements. This is, again, completely standard. And we can also take the operator U with the manifold M and surround the local operator at the point P. This is often done in two dimensions where we integrate a current around the local operator. But this easily generalizes to higher dimensions. And what we see here is that if we have an operator at the point P and U surrounds it, it acts as a representation of the symmetry on the operator. And this is what we use when we want to derive word identities. Now, if the symmetry is continuous, we can give another presentation of U in terms of a local current J, we put E to the I in integral over this manifold M of the local current. But if the symmetry is discrete, we could do not have such an integral representation, but this operator U does exist. Now, this might look in a rather strange way of presenting what the symmetry means, but this is the one that makes it easy to generalize for extended objects. Because usually, when I learned about symmetries associated with extended objects, they were not discussed as symmetries. And there was always this conundrum that there cannot be symmetries with a, with a Lorentz index. That violates the coleman mandula theorem. So that was one part that was confusing. And the other was we often discuss, so when we have strings, there is the tension, which is energy per unit length, or correspondingly, the charge per unit length. And the per unit length made it a little bit confusing, at least for me. So what we're going to do now is take the previous slide, and that's easy with PowerPoint. You just copy the slide, and just change the co-dimension of the operator. So we'll introduce a new parameter, q, an integer. Ordinary symmetries are zero-form symmetries, and these are q-form symmetries. So the difference is that the manifold m is not co-dimension 1, but it's co-dimension q plus 1. And then ordinary global symmetries have q equals 0. And this u still exists, and g is a group element. So this is the only difference, is that this m is of higher co-dimension. It's not co-dimension 1, but it's higher co-dimension. And from this moment on, this is the only place I make a new definition. From this moment on, everything just follows logically. So again, the correlation functions of this object u are topological. And we can multiply them. Here we already get something new. Since m is, has high co-dimension, it doesn't mean anything to say that we multiply in this order or another order because we can always slide one around the other because of the high co-dimension. And therefore, necessarily, the symmetry has to be a billion. Now, in the gauge version of that, we always knew that these higher form symmetries, the symmetries are a billion. But there was always this nagging feeling, yeah, it's a billion, but maybe there's a non-abelian version of it. We were just not creative enough to understand what it is. Here I'm discussing the global symmetry, and it's manifestly a billion. It's not because of something associated with this construction. And again, the same thing as before. The charge objects are associated with lines or higher dimension objects. So L could be a line and set or higher, but more generally a Q manifold. And again, it's in a representation symmetry by this M surrounding the L. So the charge operators are U and the charged operators are the Vs and they're on dimension uh, L manifold. And if the symmetry is continuous, just as for the ordinary symmetry, we can have such a u, which is written as an exponential of an integral, where this j has a different number of indices than for ordinary symmetries.
Now, we can compactify these symmetries, and if not compactify the symmetry, we compactify the space. So if space is, say, not R4, but R3 times S1, in that case, the Q-form symmetry splits to different symmetries, depending on whether this manifold, this U, does or does not wrap the circle. This is very similar to what we are familiar with in brains. A Q-form symmetry in higher dimensions leads to a Q-form symmetry and a Q-minus-1-form symmetry. So one special case of that, which will be important later, if we take a one-form symmetry in four dimensions and we compactify the system on a circle, we will find an ordinary zero-form symmetry in the lower dimensional theory, and we'll see the consequences of this lower dimensional symmetry later. I want to emphasize that nowhere here did I need a Lagrangian. I gave a property, the defining properties, in terms of the operators in the spectrum that we see. The spectrum of the theory has these operators u, which are topological. I don't have to write an explicit expression for them in terms of the fundamental fields. And we will see later that this has several consequences. First, we might have like, theories without Lagrangian, so it's better to have a, dis a description that is intrinsic to the theory. Uh, second, we will use it in dualities, where even if there is a description in terms of a Lagrangian, it might be different in the different dual frames. And we will also have examples where there is no simple description in terms of the, the dynamical fields, and, but these U's still exist, and I'll present an example of that. So let, I'll give two examples just to show that this is, can be made very concrete. And the first example would be a free field theory, a four-dimensional Maxwell theory, just a U1 field theory. And in this case, there are two such global symmetries. One of them is electric. It's associated with a conserved current, which is star f. And it can, it, we can integrate star f with an arbitrary coefficient on the surface, put it in the exponent, and get such an, such an operator. Physically, this measures the electric flux. But the electric flux of what? The charge objects are, will be Wilson lines. And the Wilson line is like the world line of a charged particle, a charged poor particle. And as it moves around, there is electric flux around it. We can also see the action of the symmetry on the fundamental field. So we gave an expression in terms of the, of the charge in terms of the fundamental fields. And also its action on the gauge fields, on the fundamental gauge fields, it shifts A by a flat gauge field. So that's what it does on the fields. And this is a symmetry of the problem. We also have a magnetic symmetry. And here, the one form symmetry is not star F, but F. So whatever I, wherever I said electric here, now I'm saying magnetic. And this symmetry also acts on the fields, but in that case, it shifts the magnetic field by a flat gauge field. This is already a point where our presentation here is in advance, because you see that the action on the fields here, we know what the presentation, what the action of the field is. We take the gauge field in the Lagrangian, and we shift it by a flat gauge field. Whereas the action on the fields here is more, more surprising, because it looks non-local in terms of A. It's only local in terms of the magnetic photon. And the charge objects, as I've already alluded, are lines, because this is a one-form symmetry in four dimensions. And we have Wilson lines, or Etoft lines, labeled by two integers, the electric charge N and the magnetic charge M. These are the charges under this symmetry and that symmetry. And intuitively, it's clear that it's a symmetry if we just fuse two Wilson lines. Where one of has charge N1, the other has charge N2. You put them together, you have something that has charge N1 plus N2. So that's obviously a symmetry. And we'll see the consequences of that a little bit later. Here's the second example. Let's start a four-dimensional SUN gauge theory. This is an interacting nonlinear theory. So this is a little bit more interesting. And here we have an electric ZN symmetry. This is the symmetry that, will that assigns charges to Wilson lines. But again, only the analogy, the action under the center of these symmetries, or of the representation of the Wilson line depends on that symmetry. Here, we can start from the group of Witten operators. They are defined by the holonomy around them. And we can specify, we can focus on the special class of operators that are quote unquote trivial, those where the group element or the conjugacy class is in the center of SUN. It's quote unquote trivial because the correlation functions of these surfaces are topological. Correlation functions are topological, and therefore one might say they are not that exciting, 
But these are precisely the generators of, that, of these symmetries. And their action on the gauge fields is taking the SUN gauge field and shifting it by a flat ZN gauge field. One way of thinking about it is in terms of lattice gauge theory. We just take all the links in the lattice and multiply them by arbitrary ZN element. Every link is multiplied by an arbitrary ZN element, such that the product of the links around each plaquette is exactly one. So that's what this symmetry does, and that's a good symmetry of the problem. Now, this system does not have a magnetic symmetry, unlike the U1 symmetry, the U1 problem we had before. One might attempt to consider a toothed lines, but the SUN theory does not have a toothed lines. If we want to define a toothed line, toothed line is the world line of a magnetic monopole, and with the magnetic monopole, we have to make sure that the Dirac string attached to it is not physical. In this theory, the Dirac string attached to it is physical, so we have to worry about, we have to worry about a surface that the toothed line bounds. So why are we doing all that? We can find various applications. I don't have time to go through all of them, so I'll just mention some of them and give a few details about others. First, we can get selection rules of amplitudes. That's the first thing we learn about symmetries. When we have a symmetry, we have selection rules about on amplitudes. Second, we can couple them to classical background gauge fields. That corresponds to thinking well, I'm not gauging this symmetry. I'm just take a flat gauge field and consider kind of twisted boundary conditions. This is familiar, say, in two dimensions when we study a system which has a symmetry. We can consider twisted boundary conditions. We are not doing the overfold. We are just twisting the boundary condition. In this can context, we can interpret the twisted boundary condition as a property, as an observable of the untwisted theory. Saying it more explicitly, it, it Tooft considered SUN gauge theory and studied them with twisted boundary condition by studying PSUN bundles, bundles that are not SUN bundles, but SUN mod ZN bundles. And maybe everybody in the audience understood it, but I was always confused whether he was studying the SUN theory or the PSUN theory. And I was confused because if he was studying the SUN theory, these are not bundles in this theory. And if he was studying the PSUN theory, he should have summed over these bundles. So which of the two was he doing? He was clearly doing something correct and useful, but I was confused. And I would like to use that to say that this should be interpreted as an observable in the untwisted theory. It's like putting a defect in the untwisted SUN theory. So this is an interpretation of known expressions. Next, we can gauge the symmetry. And again, it's very similar to what we do in Oberfold. Oberfold is gauging the symmetries. And that is done by summing over the twisted boundary conditions. And as we sum over the twisted boundary conditions, like in both in four dimensions in, with these higher form symmetries or with ordinary, sim ordinary symmetries in two dimensions when we study orbifolds, new parameters can creep in. So in the case of orbifolds in two dimensions, they are known as discrete torsion. In four dimensions, these are discrete theta parameters, new parameters in the four-dimensional gauge theory, which tell us how to sum over the twisted sectors. This is a bit reminiscent of the phase that Witten had in his talk in the odd spin structure that there was an ambiguity in a plus or minus sign, which is a similar such parameter, which is a discrete theta parameter. Now, when we consider dual field theories, dual, dual in the sense of electromagnetic duality or others, they don't have, in fact, they often do not have the same gauge symmetry. They can have two different gauge symmetries because the gauge symmetry is not intrinsic. The global symmetry, on the other hand, must be the same on the two sides. Because the global symmetry, from this perspective, is a property of some, top, some operator in the spectrum that should be the same on both sides, and it should be topological, and it should be topological in the same side, on the, on the two sides. So that gives us new tests of duality, tests that were not done, A, were not done before. So the theory that where some duality that was established had an, a chance to fail. And I should also emphasize that in all these supersymmetric theories, often these observables are not BPS. So this is a whole bunch of non-BPS observables that one might want to check. And again, the test work was done in a lot of detail in some n equals 1 and n equals 4 theories, but I'm not going to do it here in detail. Whoops, what did I do? The next application I want to consider is to, char to characterize phases of gauge theories. Now, the history of phases is that Landau gave us a characterization of phases based on global symmetries. 
So Landau said you take a system, it has a global symmetry, and you have some order parameter that transforms under the symmetry, and then the symmetry is or is not spontaneously broken, and that characterizes the different phases. Then in the 70s, Wilson and Natuft gave us new order parameters to study. These are not local operators, but lines. And now, no discussion of symmetries. There's kind of a different line of reasoning. We discuss whether the expectation value of a loop has a perimeter law or an area law. So that looks totally orthogonal to, to the previous one. I'm not going to argue that this is exactly the same as Landau's classification, but for these higher form symmetries. So I'll just give the answer. And the answer is that in a confining phase, the electric one form symmetry is unbroken. And I'll give some evidence that this is right, just by looking at the properties of the confining phase. First of all, in a confining phase, there are strings. The spectrum has strings, and if there are strings, what does protect them? They have to be protected by being charged under something. And the thing they are charged under are, is precisely this one form symmetry. The order parameter is the Wilson loop. And in a confining phase, it has an area law. That means that if we take, make the loop very, very big, its expectation value goes to zero. That's the hallmark of a symmetry being unbroken. The charge object has vanishing expectation value. So that's the second way to see that. And the third way is to compactify the system on a circle. This is what we do when we study, say, the gauge theory at finite temperature. And Polyakov and Saskind noticed that the SUN gauge theory in four dimensions, compactified on a circle, has a ZN ordinary symmetry in three dimensions. And in a confining phase, this ZN symmetry of Polyakov and Saskind is unbroken. And again, this is a question that I was confused about for many years. The three-dimensional theory has an exact ZN symmetry. It exists in three dimensions. The four-dimensional person doesn't have such a symmetry. And the ZN symmetry, we often have accidental symmetries in the infrared. That's very common in physics. But in this case, this ZN symmetry is an exact unbroken symmetry. As we go to higher and higher energies, the three-dimensional person thinks that we have an exact ZN symmetry. Where did this symmetry come from? How can we have an exact symmetry in the infrared, not violated by any high dimension operator? There must be precursor of that in four dimensions, and the precursor is this one form symmetry. And this whole story that they tell in three dimensions can be pushed up in four dimensions. There is a one form symmetry in four dimensions, and it's in the Higgs or Coulomb phase, the opposite happens. The one form symmetry is spontaneously broken. That's what characterizes these phases. And again, I'll go through all these hallmarks. First, if I renormalize the perimeter law to zero, and I make the Wilson loop very big, it's non-zero. The Wilson loop has an expectation value when it's very big. And this is the hallmark of a symmetry being broken. The order parameter that transforms under the symmetry has a non-zero expectation value. Second, there are no strings. In the Higgs phase, there are no strings. And therefore, the, the charge objects are not there. And finally, when we compactify, we can repeat the same story of Polyakov and Saskind. And in the three-dimensional theory, the symmetry is unbroken. So I'll leave you a homework problem. That if you don't solve by the end of the lecture, you can ask me in the discussion sessions. The abelian Higgs model is in a Higgs phase, the abelian Higgs model, and it has strings. So what am I talking about? How come the abelian Higgs model has strings, and even though it's in the Higgs phase? You can submit your homeworks later. I want to say a few words about the low energy behavior of these systems when the symmetry is spontaneously broken. So we can, as I said, we can repeat whatever is often done for ordinary symmetries. We have the opportunity to do it again. And we can discuss what happens when the symmetry that is spontaneously broken is continuous or discrete. The symmetry is, continu is continuous. We just follow the same reasoning as for Nambu Goldstone bosons. There must be a massless particle. And we interpret the massless particle as being a photon. And that follows from this equation. This is a non-trivial matrix element of a photon with polarization epsilon and momentum p. And this is the current, f mu nu. So this equation appears in field theory 101. And now we interpret it to mean that the photon is the Goldstone boson of this one form symmetry. Related words appeared in early work of Kovner and Rosenstein in the 90s. And more recently, Strominger and his collaborators also discussed the photon as a Goldstone boson. But I must admit that even though I discussed it with Strominger in detail, the words seem similar, 
But when we try to nail down the details, the story looks totally different. So I don't understand the relation between these two stories. In both cases, the photon is a Goldstone boson, but everything else is different. If, on the other hand, the symmetry that is spontaneously broken, this one-form symmetry, is not continuous but discrete, for ordinary symmetries, when discrete symmetry is spontaneously broken, we have domain walls. And in the low energy theory, we can think that we have a topological field theory describing the different phases, the different sides of the domain wall. The same thing is true here, except that the low energy theory, oops, the low energy theory has a Zn one form symmetry. If it's spontaneously broken Zn one form symmetry, it leads to an ordinary Zn gauge theory in the infrared. So if we see a Zn one form symmetry in the UV, which is a global symmetry, if that symmetry is spontaneously broken, the low energy observer should see a Zn gauge symmetry. This Zn gauge symmetry might be an emergent gauge symmetry in the infrared. And this is what our friends in condensed matter physics discuss as long range topological order. I'd like to say a few words about anomalies. And we'll take the simplest example, the free U1 theory. The free U1 theory, the Maxwell theory, has two global symmetries, an electric and magnetic global U1 one form symmetries. And we can try and gauge them. We can gauge the electric symmetry by shifting F mu nu by a B field. That's clearly in the gauge transformation shifts F the gauge field by a flat gauge field. And we can shift the magnetic one by adding this term. But we cannot do both. So we can gauge either the electric symmetry or the magnetic symmetry, but we cannot do both. And this is not unlike what we are familiar with in two dimensions. When we have momentum and winding symmetry, we can gauge the momentum, we can gauge the winding, but we cannot, go, we cannot gauge both. I just flash, flash one more transparency before I finish. We can have higher form symmetry protected topological phases. This is a hot topic in condensed matter. Consider a system that has an unbroken symmetry with anomalies. There's an unbroken symmetry and it has anomalies. But since the symmetry is unbroken, we can ask how is the, how is the anomaly, similar to the anomaly I just described, how is it realized in the infrared? And the Tooth anomaly matching conditions tell us that there must be something in the infrared that controls that it must be there because of the symmetries. And this is very much like the symmetry protected topological phases. And that is particularly interesting when we have a domain wall between two different phases with different anomalies. So the example that is kind of typical, N equals 1 SUSY SUN theory, which has N vacua. And even though there is a Zn symmetry relating the n vacua, the anomaly is different in the different vacua. And therefore, in the domain wall between different vacua of this system, there must be topological excitation. This is a Chern Simons theory, UK level n. This was described by these people. And this topological field theory was first observed by Achaira and Waffa using a string construction. Now we see that this is a property that is intrinsic to the gauge theory and does not depend on the string theory we embedded it in. It just follows from the anomalies of this system. So I have to conclude. High form global symmetries are ubiquitous. There are many examples in a different number of dimensions. I only scratched the surface in this talk. They help us classify operators and defects, which are high extended objects, lines, surfaces, etc. And the charge objects are if exist only if the symmetry is not broken, and these are strings and domain walls. When we have duality, these symmetries must be the same in the two dual in the dual side, and that's a highly non-trivial test of duality, so a check. And I've discussed the class the extension of Landau's characterization of phases by discuss by saying that Wilson and the story is really a story about spontaneous breaking of higher form symmetries rather than a totally orthogonal story. I also mentioned anomalies as an obstruction to gauging with the consequence of a tooth anomaly matching condition, anomaly inflow on domain wall, very much like ordinary anomaly inflow, but here for a high form symmetry. And therefore, there must be degrees of freedom on the walls. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Our questions and comments? So I was just wondering what specific information does this kind of analysis or point of view give about the 2,0 theory in six dimensions? Thank you for the question. So 
there are two different things you can mean in the two comma zero theory. First, the way it comes from string theory, it's complete, completely meaningful. It, if you compactify it on a torus, it, it does not depend on any more choices, and it has the full SL2Z symmetry. And if you take this perspective, it's not SUN, but UN, 2 comma 0 theory, or the D. And in that case, the global symmetry in six dimensions is a two-form global symmetry. And that two-form global symmetry, again, it has all the rest necessary U's and V's, et cetera. And when you compactify them on the torus, they lead to various higher form symmetries in four dimensions, including one-form symmetries like the ones I discussed. In the other perspective that you have to keep track of, say, the spin structure, things are, are, more, are more subtle. But you can always add more you once, embed it in a system that is really there. So uh, here you have been considering smooth operators, like smooth manifolds. You, one could, in principle, ask things like junctions, like junction operators which are not smooth manifolds or brain ending on brains. Have you studied also those? Yes, a, very li well. There's a lot that more that can be done. A, a little bit of that was discussed in the paper. Uh, yeah, because you can let, say, three of them meet at a, at a junction, and then when you cross in different ways, uh, you get different. So the abelian structures versus non-abelian structure, does that have an interesting interplay between these cases? The well, the, the, there is interesting interplay when you, com you combine symmetries of different dimension. Yeah. So let me give you an example. The SUN theory with n equals 1 supersymmetry, almost everything is called n here. So it's n equals 1 supersymmetry, SUN gauge theory, and it has n vacua associated with the Witten index being n, and that's associated with the global ordinary symmetry, which is Z2n broken to Z2. This system also has totally unrelated fact, a Zn one form symmetry associated with the center of the group. This, the fact that they're all the same n could not have been true for other groups. The anomalies, they are mixed, the anomalies in the one form symmetry, and there are mixed anomalies between them. And because of these mixed anomalies, the different vacua are not the same. Therefore, there are these domain walls. So there is interesting interplay between s different such higher form symmetries, uh, and, and, that, and that is an, an example. More questions? Yes? So you told us about generalized global symmetries. Are there generalized asymptotic symmetries? If I consider gravitational theory and say consider duals of this, what does it do? Okay, so this is precisely the issue about the connection to the work of Strominger and his collaborators. Okay, I gotta say that even in QED, I am totally puzzled. I don't have to go to gravity for that. So. They, these people have some asymptotic symmetries. It does depend on being with Lorentzian signature and going to null infinity and so forth. This whole story is done locally here. We don't have to go to infinity. It's in Euclidean space. So superficially, it looks different. If you look a little bit closer, it looks identical. The photon is a Goldstone boson. It's a higher form symmetry, surfaces, etc. But if you look even further than that, nothing matches as far as I can tell. So my gut reaction is that Yes, there is a connection, but I don't understand it. Okay, thank you very much.